madness, murderous fury that was buried with Jason has been reborn. Friday the 13th, part 5, a new beginning, rated R. Starts Friday at the Lions Avenue and East Sprague Cinemas. Hey everybody, welcome to the Blind Rage Podcast. This is Brandon Ford. And this is Jed Schaefer. And we are doing another Friday the 13th, and I'm sure Jed is super excited. <laughs> <laughs> but I it am genuinely excited because this is one of my favorites. We are doing Friday the 13th Part 5, A New Beginning. And this is when we first get into Roman numerals. True, which always bothered me that the numbering scheme is just like, it's digit, digit, nothing, Roman numeral. Like, I know. Pick one and, and just stay with it. But, um, yeah, this, I always, I always had a soft spot for this one. I know a lot of people hate it, but I think it's a lot of fun. And I think we're going to have a lot of fun talking about this one. Um, but before we get into that, we're just going to get the plugs out of the way quickly. Um, I would like to encourage everybody to please check out my books in paperback and Kindle editions by going to Amazon.com or the Amazon app on your smartphone, typing in Brandon Ford. You will also find my Amazon author page. Click follow to get email notifications whenever I, I have a new release. You can also check out my titles in audiobook format by going to audible.com or the Audible app on your smartphone, typing in Brandon Ford. If you don't already, please follow me on Instagram at writer Brandon Ford. You can also follow me on both Twitter and Letterboxd at Brandon Ford. Um, the Blind Rage podcast now has an official Facebook page, so please head on over there to like and subscribe. If you have any questions, comments, concerns, critiques, suggestions, recommendations, feel free to email me directly at blindragepod81 at gmail.com. Lastly, please don't forget to rate, review, and subscribe. Jed, what do you want to plug? You can follow me on Twitter at GPSG Podcast. You can find me on Letterboxd at Jed Schaefer. You can find my podcast, The Gamer Parent Strategy Guide, on all your major podcast distribution platforms, although it is on a bit of a hiatus at the moment of recording. And you can find the podcast's Facebook page at The Gamer Parent Strategy Guide. Cool. So... Um, we're just going to pretend like we didn't record another, <laughs> another episode. Um, so have you been watching anything of note? Oh, let's see. Uh, what have I been watching? Got to look at my letterbox profile here. Um, I have watched recently, uh, I saw uh, Prozac Nation. Oh. Yeah, I haven't um, seen that one in a while. I had always wanted to see it. Uh, oh, I know why you always wanted to see it. <laughs> I, I will freely admit, at first, a large part of the reason that I wanted to see it was, yes, Christina Ricci uh, naked. Um, not like she hasn't done like a... Th dozen other movies with nudity in them Has since she? then oh yeah. oh yeah oh yeah she's she's like kate winslet you put a camera in front of her and she's showing her boobs oh um 
Black Snake Moan. Uh, there were some movies she did where she was an artist, um, a famous artist. It was like a biopic. She just did it recently. Uh, I can't think of what it was. But yeah, she's she has no shame in showing off the goodies anymore. Um, mm. But I, over time, I was just curious to see what Prozac Nation was about because it got this kind of bad reputation and it got delayed of being released for like four years. And so I was just kind of curious and, um, it really hit me hard, uh, mainly because the movie is very unflinching, ugly, but very true portrayal of clinical depression. And that's something that I have a lot of experience with, uh, both two members of my family, my wife and my oldest son, both have clinical depression. So it's something that I'm right on the front lines for. So uh, that movie was just, it was the most realistic portrayal of depression that I've ever seen in a movie. Um, yeah, so, they really didn't, they really didn't stray uh, or go the Hollywood route by trying to make her character likable. They definitely went for realism, and she's very unlikable as a lead yeah. character. Yeah, you have you have sympathy for what she's suffering from, but not sympathy for her actions. Right, and and I she like the fact she's not remorseful at all for the people she hurts. Right. Um, and I like the fact that at the end of the movie, she is not all better, that she gets on medication and she's going to therapy and she admits that she is recovering and, and fighting it, but the Prozac might be turning her into a different person that isn't her real self. And she doesn't know if that's the best thing. And I, uh, I understand that because... Like I said, I see it. I, I see it personally, and uh, it that's a very realistic thought process of someone on depression medication. I was curious to read the book to see how it compares. I haven't had the opportunity, but I have heard that Elizabeth Wurzel, the real Elizabeth Wurzel, hated the movie. Hmm. I did not know that. I have. I wonder why. Mm -hmm. uh, and the other movie that I would say of note that I've seen lately is I watched the Natalie Wood documentary on HBO Max, um, the one that was done by her daughter, Natasha Gregson Wagner. Oh, she's directing now. Uh, yeah, not only did she direct it, she's pretty much like the narrator chief interviewer. Like she forms the narrative of the movie more or less oh. like she's she is the guiding hand um and how does she fare in that respect it depends on what you want out of a natalie wood documentary um if you if you want more salacious details if you want it to go into the possible the, the rumors that she uh slept with a director at a young age and that she tried to kill herself at a young age and uh, all the rumors are, uh, about the circumstances of her death. If you wanted to go really into deep into that, you're not going to get what you want. This is, I mean, it does discuss these things, but this is more about remembering Natalie Wood's life than obsessing over her death or the little minutia of the parts of her life that weren't pleasant. This is more. This is more Natasha Gregson Wagner celebrating her mom. Her mom, yeah. That that's that's what I would expect. Yeah, and and in that regard, it does a really great job. It made me. I've never seen any of Natalie Wood's movies. It made me interested in watching some of Natalie Wood's movies, and it looks. It, it was a. It was a decently put together documentary. I did have a little bit of trouble with her being the interviewer for some people, like when she interviews her own dad, um, or I'm sorry, her stepdad, Robert Wagner. And when she's mm -hmm. asking him questions about Natalie Wood's death, it, it's a little self-serving. Oh. It, yeah, it's a, it's, 
she acu- she makes outright statements about how she dislikes when the media, when certain parts of the media push an agenda about the questions surrounding her mom's death, but she herself answer or frames the questions with an agenda. So, which I get, it's, she doesn't want to think of her stepdad as being involved with the death of her mom. It's just a little awkward. Hmm. Hmm. Good, but a little awkward. I didn't know that she had any uh, behind-the-scenes aspirations. Um, I've seen her act in a handful of movies. Um, she's not very good. Uh, <laughs> I know I've seen her in something. I couldn't tell you what. Well, she's in the opening of Urban Legend. I'm sure you probably have seen that. It's, my memory's failing on that one. Um, she's the the uh, the first urban legend is the one with the guy in the back seat and the um and the um gas station attendant is trying to warn her, but she thinks he's trying he's 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 the one who wants to kill her. But um, yeah, there's really somebody in the back seat the whole time. Mm. Um. Yeah, not very good actress. Um, you could tell that um, she was um, only she only made it as an actress because she had a career handed to her, basically. At least from what I've seen, I I haven't seen her in anything and thought, wow, she did a really good job. She was in a movie with uh, Robert Downey Jr. and Heather Graham called Two Girls and a Guy that was a very, very small independent movie. And it's good. Um, she's fine in it. She's actually eclipsed by Heather Graham, who's Oof. not a good actress at all. Oof. So that... that that should say a lot right there. Um, like she lightning struck once for Heather Graham with Boogie Nights. And that was it. Like yeah. everything else she's been acceptable, barely to yikes. You're here because you're pretty, aren't you? Well, there's the, well, she's also um, really funny. I think in license to drive, um, she was she was a kid then. Boogie Nights, yes, yeah, she was really good. Um, everything else, mm-hmm. I'm embarrassed to admit that I actually, um, I used to watch Sex in the City, and they brought her on uh, as a cameo playing herself, and um. Basically, the episode was centered around um, Sarah Jessica Parker's character. She had a bad breakup with this guy, and they knew someone in common, and the person they knew in common was saying things about her, and she kept getting these odd looks from people. And um, so, basically, um, Heather was supposed to show up, to give her one of these looks and it's the most forced thing I've ever seen in my entire life even the line cause her friend goes Heather this is Carrie Bradshaw Carrie Bradshaw really and then she just makes this uh, she gives her a look that nobody would ever give anybody ever it's so inauthentic and it just astounded me that she couldn't even handle that. Um, like, like, girl, you're playing yourself. This shouldn't be out of your reach. Exactly. Oh, boy. But um, go ahead, Ed. Was there anything else that you watched? Uh, those would be the two 
biggest things that I could find in there. Two, two things worth noting, unless you really want me to go deep into the Phineas and Ferb movie. Oh, no. No, I'd rather you didn't. I didn't think so. Um, <laughs> uh, I saw... Well, mm, I used the... Um, the 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 term American remake very loosely, um, but it was the American remake of a French horror film called Inside. I don't know if you're familiar with it, no. um, but um, it's considered to be one of the uh, best examples of French horror. It's part of the new French extremity um, subgenre where it's very, very unflinching with the gore and the violence. And a lot of it, well, the majority of it takes place in one setting, in one house. Um, it's about a woman who is, it's Christmas Eve, she's nine months pregnant. She unknowingly is going to be going into labor and um it's a home invasion movie uh a woman breaks in and um wants her baby it um it's very very brutal and it's hard to watch but it's also incredibly well done um so I didn't really hold out hope that the remake was going to be very good, especially if it was a, an American remake, but it wasn't really an American remake. Um, the lead girl uh, was played by Rachel Nichols, who I hadn't really seen before. I didn't really know her. Um, it was a Spanish production that was shot in Spain and was supposed to take place in Chicago. And... It was um, by the people who did Wreck. Uh, so they had some uh, some notoriety there. I think that's why they were given the movie. But the screenplay was clearly written by somebody whose first language was not English. Because it did not ring true at all the dialogue and um i couldn't really determine whether the dialogue was the problem or the acting was the problem uh because i didn't like either um and the movie got mixed reviews and while people those who didn't like it said they or gave praise to the performances of Rachel Nichols and um, the other actors who whose name is escaping me. Um, but they made some changes I thought that were not good. Um, and one thing that they changed that I really didn't like and I had a feeling that they were going to change was the ending. Because with a lot of the, a lot of French horror films, especially those in the new French extremity, they don't end on a happy note. Their endings are generally very bleak. And this one has an incredibly bleak ending. Um... They changed it, yes. Um, while it's not, um, it's not, uh, well, I guess on how you, how you look at it, it's not necessarily a happy ending. Um, but it's, it, it's also, uh, how, do I, how do I put this? It's, it's not, an ending that, uh, that it's, it's kind of a relief, I'll say. Um, but 
it's 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 not the ending that I wanted because it's not the ending that made the the original film work so well. Um, and I thought it was a cop out um, because I thought that including this ending in the original film was incredibly brave on the filmmakers part and especially since it was their first movie and it was very highly regarded um so it was it was basically a case of you shouldn't fix what isn't already broken and i don't think the movie needed to be remade first and for foremost and second i don't think it needed to be fucked with um so yeah, no, didn't like it at all. Um, other than that, and I feel kind of odd talking with you about this since we already had a very lengthy exchange about it via text, but I saw the Alanis Morissette documentary that HBO put out, uh, which was called Jagged. And, um... Uh, I enjoyed it. I thought it was an interesting look into her evolution as a singer and a songwriter and a performer. Um, I thought she was very honest and um, I thought she stayed a little too focused on the one record. Um, her other records were not even mentioned at all, uh, not even in passing. Um, it was just all about the influence of Jagged Little Pill, uh, which is really, um, her only, uh, um, what do you call it? It's, it's what she's primarily known for because she had tried and failed several times after the fact to emulate the success of that first record and she hadn't even come close. Um, for actually I, I, uh, shouldn't even say her first cause that was not her first, her first American we'll say, or her first, uh, major label debut, major, major label, um, debut, which it, um, I don't know. I don't know if it was her, it, it was a major label because it was under uh, Madonna's boutique label, uh, Maverick, which she had under Warner Brothers. Um, she talked about, I was hoping as a Madonna fan, I was hoping that she was going to talk more about her interaction and meeting her. Because um, Madonna, uh, Alanis and Prodigy, I think were the biggest um, biggest acts that she signed to the Maverick label. Um, but, um, yeah, um, and there was, there were some cute moments with her kids where she was singing to her kids. I thought it was nice. Um, she was honest about her eating disorder and depression. Um, so, um, while it wasn't fluff, uh, it wasn't something that I would say was brutally in your face, honest, but it was at the same time, I thought very interesting. And while she has detached herself so far from it, I really don't know. She hasn't said specifically or explicitly what her issue with it is other than this isn't the story that I wanted to tell. That's all she says. Um, and she said that she knew right away that things were going to be going in a different direction when she saw a rough cut. Um, I don't know. I really don't know. Because it wasn't like things were manipulated to make her come across as bad because she doesn't come across as bad at all um the only thing that i could think of was that perhaps she was trying to um uh 
um, uh, uh, put more of a, a sense of, of warning on um, young artists, younger artists, of what it is like to live in that world or what it was like for her because you know she was forced to lose weight um when she hit puberty when she was still doing her pop records um she actually had people watching every or counting every calorie um and that made her develop an eating disorder and uh caused her to, to go into some depression and um it was shot right after I think she had her her second child and it was during during uh, COVID and she had three bouts with postpartum depression and she said that the director kind of took advantage of that. I'm really not. I don't know. I, I don't know. She didn't come across as depressed. She came across as very happy. Uh, she, there was moments she, she was telling jokes, you know, she was having fun with her kids. There's a moment where she's like signing, uh, vinyl, um, where she was, uh, kind of wacky and they showed home videos. Um, I don't know. I, I, it's, it's really a head scratcher to me is why she didn't like it. I don't yeah, know. Yeah. All the. I've tried to find an, any kind of article where she uh, where she goes into it because I had heard about it before it came out um, that she wasn't happy with the final product. She never specifies. Her agent never specifies. Like all they will say is we don't like it. It's not representative of the of the whole truth. Like okay, but what? What's yeah. the problem? And she said that there were untruths that were mentioned in 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 the documentary. Well, only the only people who were interviewed were those closest to her, um, and that was her drummer, who went on to um, be in the Foo Fighters, who hit the drummer from her first tour. I, I think she's still friendly with um, a couple friends, um, Guy O'Siri from Maverick. There weren't, there weren't a whole lot of people talking on her behalf. So I really don't know who she could have had an issue with. Um, but yeah, she is so unhappy with it that she didn't show up to any of the screenings and do any press for it. Um, the only press that she did do for it were to give quotes to certain um, websites and magazines to say how much she hates it without exactly saying why. So I don't know. Maybe she'll make her own documentary and tell the story that she wants to tell at some point. Um, I don't know. I liked it. I thought it was good. But, and I'm not even really, I was never really a fan of her music. Primarily because I tend to be, or tended to be a contrarian with a lot of music when I was a teenager. It's like, if everybody else is into this, well, guess what? Fuck that. I'm not listening to it. So I never owned Jagged Little Pill. Although I did kind of secretly like some of the singles. I did own it, but I really didn't like it much beyond the singles. And even then, it was an album that got far less play in my CD player than Smashing Pumpkins and Oasis and, you know, other big bands at the time. Oh, you know what she did address? that I really didn't think she was going to. Well, she didn't say who, but she did talk about You Ought to Know and all the speculation about Dave Coulier. And um, she said without saying that it's not about him. Um, but she also says that um, whenever... 
it's mentioned um, that the song was was written about him. Nobody ever talks about that she also had relationships with eight other guys around that time that the album was done and the song was written. So you have to look into her lineage, which I don't have time for, and do your own process of elimination. But she did say that she has been amused over the years to hear um, which guys think the song is about them. Um, but she won't say. And is, 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 I think she wants it to be like her... Um, her you're so vain i was just gonna say that it sounds a lot like that like she wants she she uh, wants the mythos that you're so vain has yeah i would want i would want that too yeah I mean, that song's gonna win. right once we know who the hell cares yeah exactly <laughs> all right um well, that is it for my uh, recent viewings. So, I don't know about you, Jed, but I'm super jazzed for a new <laughs> beginning. I'm super something. <laughs> uh, it, it, it's a movie. <laughs> it's not, I don't hate it, but it's awkward. We will, we will discuss. We will discuss. Yes. Okay. All right. Uh, so we're going to get started now. If anybody wants to watch along, uh, I'm sure I don't have to tell you where to find a Friday the 13th movie unless you live in a third world country. Here we go. Three, two, one, play. Okay. All right. Uh, we just got to get the obvious stuff out of the way that everybody knows. This whole... Well, that's a woman. Um, and this whole sequence was shot in Corey Feldman's backyard. Over like a day. While he was on a break from the Goonies. Uh, so he really didn't do much. And... Um, so yeah, there's that. And I want to, I want to say that Corey has said spectrum of Corey truth. Mm -hmm. We've, as we've established, right. um, I want to say that I heard him say once that he wanted to come back for this movie, like in full, but that his agents were going, okay, one, no, you're in the Goonies. That's going to be much bigger. Two, you don't want to go back to that well that'll get you pigeonholed in horror. I always, I've always, i always had a problem believing that because if this was only came out a year after Final Chapter. Right. So at most, Corey's 13, maybe? Something like that. Four, 14 tops I, and i'm pretty sure he was like 12 in the during the 11 or 12 during the filming of a final chapter but once we get to the proper you know the the non-prologue part of this movie where it's the the older tommy jarvis he couldn't have passed for that time he couldn't have played that role so unless they were going to have him be like a 13-year-old amidst all of these teenagers, it, it doesn't make any sense. Well, um, from what I remember hearing, there, are, there was a totally different script written that centered around a, a Tommy of this age, and they were going to play up the angle of him being the next Jason. Um, and that would have happened had he not been doing the Goonies. I'm glad that they didn't go that route. 
Cause I'm, I'm, I, I, I'm glad they didn't go that route for two words. Halloween 3. Not that Halloween 3 is a bad movie, but more to the point that once you've established the franchise in a certain direction, you veer off into really experimental territory, and there's just such a huge fan backlash. Uh, it, it makes it hard to for that new idea to gain any traction, which isn't the best thing. I mean, that there should be allowed to deviate from formula, but... Mm -hmm. um, I, if Tommy Jarvis had been the killer, I don't think anybody would have liked that. It just wouldn't have felt right. Honestly, I think people would have hated it more than they hated this one. Oh, yeah, I agree. Um, and, and I don't I don't think there was anything I could be wrong, but I don't think that the script was centered around um, the halfway house either. Um, but um, that doesn't sound like him. I'm pretty. I'm pretty sure they looped those whimpers. Um. What were you gonna say? I don't recall. <laughs> um, I I do recall the first time I saw this, and for the longest time, and for the longest time, I mean from like ages eight to like ten. Fucking <laughs> when I was watching these movies. I, I saw them all out of sequence. I just saw whatever was available whenever it was available. Um, but I purposely avoided this one because I'd heard from so many people that it was just awful. And when I was a kid, one of my favorite things to do, if I had a few extra dollars in my pocket, which was rare, was walk on down to a department store and peruse every single VHS tape that they had and pick something up. And on this particular occasion, they didn't have anything that I wanted. They did have Friday Five. And um, with the way that I was um, back then, as far as being fanatical about horror and watching or discovering new stuff all the time, if I'd gone home with nothing, it would have been, it wouldn't have been, it, no, if I'd gone home with nothing, it would have been more depressing than if I'd gone home with something shitty. So... I decided to take a chance and I watched it that night in my bedroom by, my, by myself and I was so into it, especially the whole end sequence at the barn. I was screaming at the TV the whole night. I thought it was awesome. And for the life of me, I didn't understand why people hated it so much. And, um, there has become, there has, a, a, a call following for this one has developed. Um, and I think that's because finally people are starting to appreciate the better parts of it. I mean, mm, to be honest with you, I never really, um, took umbrage with, Roy being the killer. I I think that is a pretty interesting and innovative way to twist things. Because that is a twist that you don't see coming at all. 
This is a Friday the 13th movie. You're, expect, you're expecting to see Jason, and you're seeing Jason the whole time. You think you're getting Jason the whole time, but it's not Jason. And I think that's pretty a pretty decent mindfuck right there. And I don't think it got the appreciation it deserves for its originality. I, I never can, had... Go ahead. Go ahead. I was just going to say, I can hear that you wholeheartedly disagree with me. Um, I don't have a problem with the concept of Roy Burns as the killer. Okay. The idea of someone imitating Jason, uh, dressing up as him, you know, doing uh, perpetuating killings, returning to a mystery element. I'm fine with that. The original was a mystery. I have, you know, that that makes sense to try and do, you know, after three films that were in large part identical and all about horny teenagers in a, at the lake. Um, it is nice that this movie changes its uh, changes its setting. Uh, its protagonist is not the, a final girl and is not, um, you know, talkative or even you know, full of personality, he's mentally damaged. I appreciate that. And like I said, I appreciate the concept of the Roy Burns killer. I think the execution is incredibly flawed. Okay. Um, and that's because the motivation makes no friggin' sense whatsoever. He's one, it's presented as if he had this love for his son, but he didn't know where his son was, which feels off to me, considering that he was working as a paramedic in town, in the same town that the son is in a halfway house in. Uh, but even strip away that, when his son is killed, he goes on a revenge spree against everybody but the person who killed his son. Well, he couldn't because he was in jail. Right. But then why kill anybody? Because he cracked. But it doesn't. That doesn't add up to me. Um. Well, uh, to me I that to me that's uh, Jed, to me that just it just um, doesn't it doesn't it doesn't hang for me. It, I don't want to go. False. I don't want to go do really dark here because you have three boys. But if you saw your son, one of your sons, like that. You would lose your mind. I, oh, yeah. I, if one of my sons died, I would. it would devastate me. But I wouldn't kill my neighbors. Murdering 20 people in the immediate vicinity would not cross my mind. Drinking would cross my mind <laughs> heavily and continuously. Uh, but murder yeah, of, a do of two dozen strong? <sighs> Well, I, we're talking I, slasher movie mentality. But but see, even then, I can't give it that excuse because at, as much as the reveal at the end of the original Friday is a bit of a cheat in that they gave you no breadcrumbs, no suspects, no red herrings. I like that, though. I don't. I think that's lazy. I think that is the worst kind of script writing. Um... I don't think it's. I, I think it betrays what the relationship between the storyteller and the audience. Uh, but I'm willing to overlook it for the sake of this. Um, at the very least, they establish her with a great motive. Mm -hmm. It's directly connected. She has lost her mind. She blames not only the people there, but she has a hard time. She has such a disassociative. Uh, state of mind or insanity um, or state of mind uh, that she views everybody that works at that camp as Barry and Claudette and she views the very existence of the I can't camp. you know their names. I, dude, I'm a, I'm a huge nerd, man. <laughs> I Barry, don't think I ever heard their names before. Barry Jackson and Claudette Hayes. Oh my god, I don't think yeah. I ever knew that. Um... She views everybody, though, there as them, and she views the camp as just as much as culpable as the people. So I get that mentality, but mm -hmm. 
I, um, and maybe I could accept the Roy Burns as kill, you know, killing people at the halfway house if he if it just stuck to the halfway house. But when he's killing the greasers and the ambulance driver and his girlfriend at the diner and uh, dot 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 all the on non associated people demon and his girlfriend um just what the hell <laughs> just it, it it breaks everything down for me well um we don't really know all that much about roy um other than he abandoned his son and he was a paramedic um it could have been that he didn't abandon his son. Maybe his son was taken away from him because he had some kind of mental instability and he was unfit. Or maybe he abused him. Um, th there's an infinite possibility. Um, there is. I will say, though, I would have liked the movie to explore that then. To explore, yeah, okay and That's and fair. i think and i and i think the best way to do that would be to get rid of some of the characters mm. because i think this is an over this cast is overstuffed like get rid of the bikers get rid of lana and and, and bald guy uh, get. I know that they're the comedy centerpiece of the movie. Get rid of crazy redneck grandma and junior. Um, get rid of all those ancillary characters that don't add anything and build the other characters up, especially and mainly Roy. Um, you know, let the other characters have time to breathe. Quick note about um, Lana, and I know my. My opinion really doesn't really count you know, for obvious reasons. Um, but, and I, I know, what's her name? Deborah uh, Voorhees is very, very, very popular. Okay. I think Lana has the better boobs. Uh, I think they're more playboy boobs. Mm. They're not. I wouldn't. Uh, better. Uh, I, I think they're the more immediately visually appealing boobs, but I think they're they look a little more fake. Mm. Personal taste. I, it's. I I can see what you mean though. Visually, visually, yes, they are a little more. Um, obviously appealing yes i mean i i knew i was gay my whole life but i just remember being a kid and watching this and thinking hmm those are some nice titties um getting back to my vhs of this one thing that always fucking drove me crazy was the big picture on the back of the or the, the uh the what do you call it not the screenshot, the publicity shot of the, what do you call it? Him right there, the son with the uh, machete to his neck mm -hmm. that's not in the movie. Right. That always drove me fucking crazy. It all, and they seem to do that a lot. There were shots, there were other movies in this series. Uh, two had one. Um, it had an alternate shot of the double impalement that isn't in the movie. They seem to like to do that to lure to put shots on the back that that were cut out or altered. Well, like I said for my commentary for the first one, ugh, the shot for the original with the arrow in the target. What? Why? Yeah, that really, and it was a daylight picture. From yes, it doesn't convey suspense to me at all. I mean, I no, know she looks startled, but it does. This doesn't cry. Oh, this is going to be scary. No, you know, 
You know what it makes me think of? It makes me think of the movie Meatballs. Mm. Yeah. Just kind of a wacky summer camp romp comedy. And yeah. There's um, Juliet Cummins over there from uh, Film by Party Massacre 2. Um, now, what, ha- what, what is his deal right here? Um, what the fuck's his name with the axe? Vic. Vic, thank you. He looks about 50. Yeah. Why is he here? Well, that question could be asked of a lot of these people. Like, well, um, they all, they, everybody else looks like they belong together in some way or another. Oh, you're speaking age wise. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. No. Yeah. Age wise, he does not fit the rest of the. Uh-uh. Oh, no. For the longest time, I did not know that Brooke Bundy was Tiffany Helms' mother. Really? Oh, you didn't know that either. Really no. <gasps> Do you know the whole um, story about um, Dominic, whatever his name is, and um, Corey Haim? No. Well, allegedly. Um, Corey Feldman wrote all about this in his book, which I'm ashamed to admit that I read, um, and read, read, I didn't listen to the audio book because I could not listen to an audio book read by Corey Feldman. <laughs> um, but yeah, he doesn't name names in the book, but he talks about this older guy who he knows is gay and he was in the Hollywood scene um, like he knew people who knew people or whatever and um, because Corey Haim had some bad experiences on the set of Lucas uh, with Charlie Sheen it kind of fucked with his brain as molestation does and but he just thought that this is what happens when you're on a movie set you fuck around with your with your co-stars that's that's just what's done so um he and Feldman were in a hotel room together with Dominic and he tried to start something. His words were... He tried to start something with, with Dominic Feldman. Braska? With Feldman. Oh, okay. okay. He was like, why don't you take care of me? That's what, Those were his exact words. And Feldman was like, I'm not gay. And Haim was like, I'm not gay either, but I, I thought this is what guys do with guys. And Feldman was like, no. Um, but if you want, Dominic's gay. And he said it as a joke. And Haim looked at him and went, is he for real? And Dominic, who was like 25... And Haim was like, I want to say 14, 15. Um, uh, So what ended up happening was Dominic had an adjoining room. And they went over to Dominic's room and had, they did what they did. And... Feldman said there were a lot of sounds coming from that room. Very loud, moaning sounds that made him very uncomfortable. And after that, um, 
Dominic and Haim became kind of an unofficial thing. Uh, where because Haim was too young to drive at the time, so Dominic would drive in places, and I guess as a reward, Haim would fuck around with them. And this went on for a while. Um, so, yeah, there was there was a lot of impropriety between the two of them. Um, and Feldman has a lot of disdain, understandably so, toward Dominic because of that. And he doesn't think that Haim was the first or only younger uh, child actor that Dominic messed around with. He later, he didn't say, like I said, he didn't say the, his name in the book. But later on when he started to, his whole campaign with spreading the truth about uh, pedophilia in Hollywood, he, he named Dominic's name hmm. as one of them. One thing I want to say about this before the scene is over. Everybody always says that these are the first... This is the first gay couple in the series. I don't think so. Yeah, I heard that theory recently for the first time. Um, it was on the Dead Meat podcast, and I was I was like, "What? I I never took them as that." Well, I'm pretty sure. Uh, not Pete. The one who's fixing the car. Pretty sure he's he's gay in real life. Um, but I never took them as a gay couple because they say right away that they're on their way to meet girls. Well, they say those cons aren't going to wait forever. But they're on their way to meet girls. So why would they be a gay couple? That never made sense to me. But Fair it's, point. it's, um, it's, it's, it's a common belief among a lot of, um, fans of the series that, um, yeah, that they were gay and this is the first gay couple in, in the franchise. And even him has, even he rather has said in one of the documentaries commented on it that he assumed that they were supposed to be gay. That was a really bad effect. Yeah, that that was a uh, ugly, a uh, cool idea for a kill, but not very well done. No, it looked too much like a rubber head. I'm pretty sure he was just making this uh, this singing. From what I've heard, yeah, um, the director Danny Steinman was far more interested in doing coke than he was actually directing and uh well i think he i think he said i think he just i don't think he gave him any motivation i think he just said when you get back into the car do something yeah and that was that, that was basically it that's pretty much what i've heard too that a lot of the movie there's a lot more improv in the movie than you think there is yeah. Because of that, that he just was like, yeah, don't worry about the script. Just, uh, I'll turn the camera on and you do your thing. Well, except when there was a sex scene. Yes. In that <laughs> case, he was heavily invested. Oh, quite. Yeah. Um, and I liked how M Melanie Kinnaman wasn't shy about how he was towards her in her interviews. Um... Was, yeah, he was a dick. Yeah, uh, no one, as far as I know, has been very. Every, everyone's been pretty up forward with the fact that he was pretty, uh, um, skeezy. Yeah, quite. Um, and I believe, uh, right. His movie, the movie that he did before this was Savage Streets, which has a pretty nasty gang rape of, well, it's Lemay Quigley, who's like 28 at the time, or like 25, 
but she's supposed to be like 14. Um, and it's quite gratuitous. Um, but everything that he did before this, um, as far as features, they were sleazy. And then you look at what he was doing before features. <laughs> and you know where it came from. You know where it came from, <laughs> exactly. It's like, yeah, well, that makes a lot of sense. Um, I think this is so cute, this scene with the, <laughs> with the grandfather and Reggie. It is cute. And it's very... Um, like that's a very natural thing. Like, yeah. Like yeah. that is such a that is such a reaction that every boy around that age is like, yeah, dad, don't I mean I know this is granddad, but still same point of, you know, dad. Well don't, that, don't show me if don't show me physical affection in front of people. That and the way he like kind of chuckles when he sees how upset that Reggie is. I always thought that was cute. Um and then he and then he hugs him. It's a, it's a scene that's very much out of place in this movie. Right. It's very heartwarming in a movie yeah, that is, it's, is it's very... Sweet. Yeah. In a movie that's very trashy. <laughs> um, what I, one thing that I don't like is you really don't know exactly what why everybody's there except for Tommy right like that's always kind of annoyed me too that this is a halfway house which means these people at some point were institutionalized right. uh, what are the problems here we mm -hmm. have a punk uh, a promiscuous couple a stutterer I have no idea what Julia Cummins' problem is. Um, I don't know, because she's the one who seems the most quote-unquote normal out of all of them. Tommy, mind telling Eddie to and even the ones that don't aren't quote-unquote normal, I don't see anything that justifies keeping them in a halfway house. No. Mm -mm. Like stuttering. I had a nephew no. who stuttered. Ooh, he, <laughs> he didn't need 24-7 mental health monitoring for yeah. stuttering. Yeah, and that seems to be his only problems. His only problem. He doesn't appear to have special needs or anything like that. Um, Relax, Chief. What's wrong? No sense of humor? Can't you take a joke? Now, this is something that uh, I was... It's cool. Yeah. But where the hell did he learn to fight? I mean, this guy's got some, like, that's, MMA skills. Yeah, exactly. That is, that's badass. And I'm not yeah. really somebody who looks for those kinds of, like, stunts in movies. But I, I always did admire that flip. That was, that was pretty awesome. And it's some, it's a good way to take somebody down a couple of pegs. Yeah. <laughs> This, I always felt bad for that guy because I thought he was hot. And she is funny. I think she's one of the best things in this movie. She definitely, like, my opinion on her has gone up and down over the years. Like, I found her hilarious as a kid, and then for a time, I hated it. And I've come back around to the point where I can appreciate how... Like she's a hundred percent into this. She uh -huh. is. She she's is throwing. A blast. Oh yeah, yeah, she's throwing everything she's got at this, and it's uh -huh. it. Her energy. It's hard not to embrace. Yeah. Her energy. Like that that scene earlier on, um, when she's first introduced, she's talking to the cop, and she's going off on him, and then at the end, she just mutters, "I have a bomb." <laughs> I swear to you. What? You what? <laughs> <laughs> and that was an ad lib. Uh, that was an ad lib. I've heard her say that. Oh, was it? <laughs> yeah, she just she was struggling for something to add to it, just to be uh, 
just to be uh you know a little more saucy and a little more of a psycho you know the the character already was and just out of the blue it just popped in their head she just added i have a bomb <laughs> <laughs> okay sure it works well she had a reputation her character had a reputation for being crazy and i think she knew that so i think she knew that her character could say whatever to the police and they would just you know back off yeah i like this i always like this here because he's fucking jovial as hell right now roy It's when you weird. first see him, yeah. he's like, you know, he almost looks like he's, it's his first day on the job. He do, he's not, he doesn't talk to anybody. He really doesn't look at anybody. Um, the other guy's popping gum, you know, he's having a good time. And now he's got confidence. His shoulders are back. He's got his voice when he talks. He sounds cheerful. Um... And I always like that. Sorry, Buster, we're close. <laughs> That's all right. I just want to take out orders. You do? Huh? Yeah. I don't know. I mean, I would like as much as it is flawed, I think there are little bits here and there. Um, where uh, I hesitate to use the word smart, but um. Clever. Sure. <laughs> I can go with that. And I won't. I should say, I don't think this is an irredeemably bad Friday the 13th movie. It is not in my. If I were to rattle off the order in which I prefer these, this is not in the bottom four. This is mid tier. Um, it is flawed but so is the original so it's it, it's not without its charms like of all the movies because friday the 13th is not high art it's stupid <laughs> i can admit friday the 13th is stupid this is the one movie that puts its arms around its own stupidity and just embraces it with all its heart mm-hmm it and it also always, kicks uh, it up a couple of notches too. Yeah, it does. It doesn't, you know, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. It's not a perfect movie by any stretch, but there's there's far worse sins in this series' annals than this movie. Oh yes. I'm sure you've heard the story about the tension between these two actors. Um, I don't think so. So, um, the guy, um, I believe his name is Bobby DeSimone, uh, because he was supposed to snort cocaine in that previous scene. Well, they use uh, whatever, what's the stand in, but I think not baby I powder. I think it's powdered milk. Yeah. Powdered milk. So he's doing, he, he's doing the scene and he, and I'm, Cocaine was flying all over the set anyway. Like, sure. Um, but he was not someone who used it at all. And the actress who plays Lana was married to someone by a, a guy by the name of Vic Sharkey, who was connected to cocaine rings. Oh, no. And Bobby D. Simone made a comment about Vic Sharkey, not knowing that she was married to him. And it was not a flattering comment. And yeah, that, that kind of soured their relationship. Oh boy. And he made that comment before they had to film this stuff. Ooh. Well, I guess it's a good thing that they really don't have any scenes where they're in direct contact with each other because you know they're never in the car together right other than that leaning out the door moment that's pretty much it Sorry. Billy? 
I do wish of all the movies that got hammered by the MPAA in this series, this is the one that I think it hurts the most. Well, yeah, because it it um, revels in its sex and violence. Yeah, and this movie is, this is cute. almost antiseptic in its kills. Like, that axe to the back of the head, it looked like he was hitting a pillow. And it, sh I, it would have been so awesome if we had seen blood splatter and... I, you know, a lot of the kills just they're they're lacking in in blood and in the carnage that makes the movie fun and like you said, this one revels in it so much it it really needed that that violent edge. Mm -hmm. I always thought this this pan, panning shot, oh, panning away of her. With the axe in her torso, it was pretty grisly. And if she was, but if she was getting chopped like that, the axe I think would have been deeper. But we had to see it stick out, protrude, right. um, yep. at the perfect angle. Um. Um. Um, I'm trying to think of, um, of scenes where I think the, what you see is insufficient. Um, because I do like, I know it's not perfect because of the big clockwise, counterclockwise, but I do like the scene with the, the, the belt. Uh, um, around what's his face his eyes um, yeah that's a cool uh, regardless of the counterclockwise clockwise problem um, that's a really sadistic kill yeah that's, it's that's, nasty yeah I every time I see that I just my head hurts because oh well and um, fucking What's her name? Deborah Voorhees' character. Not only does she get the clippers, but he chops them too. Yeah. Um. So I think that works, even though you you don't you don't see the the blades penetrate. Yeah, that one they they got around it, the the gore well with seeing the clipping but without seeing them being in and the, the, the sound effect that yeah. was a nice that was a nice workaround mm -hmm. this. um juliet cummins death you don't like what the fuck happened i don't even think you know um i think danny steinman was um, a little too focused on her nude scene than her death scene. Yeah. Because uh, the nude scene is languorous. Um, same thing with um, the guy with the stuttering. You just see the, the cleaver, but you don't really see anything. Um, wasn't there like a big thing with Tiffany Helm where she was she was supposed to get split up the middle? Yeah, she was supposed to be like, I've, they because there's even a still of it in the Crystal Lake Memories book. There's a picture of her sitting, and she's got like one leg up, um, and the other leg kind of spread over, and. She's just blood, like it's. It was done after the shot, and she's just blood from like mid thigh to uh, mid torso, wow. and it was supposed to be that she got cleaved right through the vagina and kind of like um, handstand guy in part three. Yeah, but I don't remember if they couldn't pull it off or if the MPAA didn't if they lost their shit about it and they had to read I think 
I think the latter. Probably, considering the other kills in this movie, that probably it. So yeah, you get your for her. You just get your basic run of the mill stabbing. That uh, boring. And it's clearly a pillow. Like you could tell uh, the way it's filmed, they're clearly stabbing into someone's pillow. I would have been mad if I were her, because they always say whenever an actor, um, because they're all they they were all filmed, you know, secretly under these fake titles because they didn't want press or Jason fans to show up to the set. So it was like whenever um, one of the actors realized that they were in a Friday the 13th movie, they always wanted to know how they were going to die. And um, a lot of people looked forward to their death scenes. Right. Um, and um, if I were her, I would have been mad. I'm like, that's all I get? Well, I guess it's better that than an off-screen kill. Right. Um, the mom in part four who just looks startled and is never seen again. Yeah, that's not good. I thought that was funny with him. And, um, and uh, I think it's, well, I think they, they recycled both uh, his interviews for both, his name was Jason and um, Crystal Lake Memories. How he said the way it's edited, they, it made him look like quick draw McGraw. <laughs> Yeah, it does. It does. Yeah. But oh my god. I I can't imagine what the dailies of what of that scene looked like. Cuz everybody has said it was akin to porn. Softcore, yes. but porn. Uh, I don't remember which actor or crew member or whatever said it, but I remember one of them saying that Steinman was behind the camera screaming, fuck her harder, fuck her harder, faster, harder. Grab her pussy. Yeah. And like... <laughs> well, I, you that shouldn't had even, to have been uncomfortable even, for her. Oh, right. Like, you shouldn't even be saying that on a movie like Eyes Wide Shut, where, it, where sex is... A major component of the plot, let alone what is supposed to be, you know, thirty seconds of the, of a horror movie. Yeah, and I sincerely doubt he took the two of them aside beforehand and said, "What are you comfortable with?" Oh yeah, definitely not. I never crossed his mind. A lot, a lot of the time, um what directors do at least sensitive ones um well unless it's uh, unless it's um the scene is um is uh it takes place in a very specific place and has to be lit a certain way or the way things happen um affect a story a director will let the actors choreograph the sex scene themselves. Which is reasonable. I mean, they're the ones that have to be butt naked and rubbing against each other. Yeah. Um, Jake Gyllenhaal said that when he did his sex scene with Jennifer Aniston in um, The Good Girl, she, <laughs> I, don't, I don't really think it was very... It was meant to be very risque anyway. Um, it was standard on a bed missionary, um, but she insisted on a pillow um, between them. Hmm. I mean, that's what makes her comfortable. Yeah. And... Um... Like a pillow down below, or a pillow? Yeah, she had a. She wanted a pillow on a, on her vagina. I, you know, I'm fair. I can understand that. That's it's uh, even with what are they called? It's not crotch cups, but they have like devices or cups of some sort. I know that they can use in sex scenes that they p 
put on genitals so that way there's you know they don't end up rubbing together and uh I have to imagine even still that that's that's real close yeah like that's, re that's real the, close to the truth <laughs> yeah but from what I remember um it's been a while since I've seen that movie but from what I remember there, there there's a lot of betting um so their bottom halves were covered anyway so she could have been wearing blue jeans um but um and you always hear actors say how um unsexy doing sex scenes is because of all the crew and the lights and the director and blah 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 blah, blah. but sometimes and i think i think that is well mm -hmm. I will say 50-50 probably it's um, actors trying to be professional and saying no I don't get aroused you know I'm a professional blah 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 um, some of them it, yeah it's true and some of them no um, I, I find it hard to believe, hard to believe, especially when you're with some of these incredibly attractive people, um, that you don't get some, if you're, uh, you know, if you're a working, if you're, everything's working as it should. I can't remember who it was. Fuck. Um, fuck. Um. I don't know, but it was so, it was some it was a male actor who was doing was supposed to do a risque sex scene, and he took something beforehand so that he wouldn't get aroused. <laughs> okay. Because I don't remember who the who the actress was, but it was somebody very attractive, and he was he was nervous about that. I you know I. If I was in that situation, I would be too. Like, yeah, I'm a happily married man. Been married for 18 years, but if I'm suddenly told, hey, you've got to be in this scene and, uh, you know, rub your hands all over Alice and Bree, I'm going to have a hard time resisting biology. It's... It's going to do what it wants to do, regardless of the fact of me saying, this is for money, this is fake, this is for a scene. It's still going to have, you know, biology <laughs> happens. <laughs> you know what I heard recently, and I never heard this before, and I can't say that I'm really the big the, the biggest pieces fan. I think it's really stupid. Um, but the guy who does the full frontal... Um, when he was doing his sex scene, apparently he got quite excited and they had to wait to do his nude scene because he was so excited and they had to get a bag of ice to put on him <gasps> to calm him oh down a bit. Oh God. I, not to... Not to get too personal, but um, um I, I uh, of the two of us, when we stopped to set, when my wife and I decided to have no more kids, we decided that I would be the one to get snipped. Okay. Faster, re faster recovery time. It's like a week and a half recovery time for a woman. It's like you could do. It's a twenty-minute surgery for guys, and it and recovery time is like over a weekend. Um, but for forty-eight hours. You pretty much are told, hold an ice pack on your balls. Right. That ain't comfortable, man. I would no matter how not. No matter mm. how much ibuprofen you pound, constantly icing your balls is, uh, it's unpleasant. <laughs> well, no, nothing would happen if you got excited. Would it? Because the incision go is on your scrotum, so. 
Yeah, but it kind of pulls at that skin, so... Um... I mean, it wouldn't pull much, because the incision is further down, but... Um... I mean, the ice is just there mostly to help with pain. Mm-hmm. But just the thought of ice on the genitals is just... And especially a, to ice down an erection so that way you can film a scene. Oh, 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 oh man. Uh, well, that must have been pretty fucking humiliating, too, on top of that. Right? Yeah, hold on. Sorry, I got wood because of my co-star and being naked in bed with her. I've got to ice my schwans down so we can continue filming. Mm. Yeah. So I don't know how to pivot away from that to this. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm not even going to try. I'm just going to hard cut. Um, did you... The song that they're about to sing... Where, you know, the, the quote-unquote song. It's a, Yeah, I was just going to say, it's not much of a song, but go ahead. There is, like, a disco techno remix available on YouTube. Oh, wow. Oh, apparently, and there's more than one. There's apparently Friday fans have turned this into a thing. I believe there's, it. There's, there's dance mixes, there's EDM mixes, there's techno mixes... You wouldn't think that that could be done with a song that's got like what? one word. Yeah. It's not even a lyric; it's just one word. Yeah, basically. one one word, a sound effect, and like four notes. I really, I don't even want to listen to this. So I don't, I don't think I'm going to be checking those out. I heard a snippet of one of them. It's so bizarre. It's kind of like um, the one that I heard was very, was very fast paced. A lot of high beats per minute, kind of like a synth wave. Mm -hmm. um, so definitely the type of thing you would hear in like in a in a really a gay club. I was just gonna say a really, really high energy dance club, but. Um, yeah, it's it's odd. It's well, really gays odd. love gays love horror, so I could I could I could. They used to play. Um, it was commonplace for um, the scene of Jesse dancing in his bedroom to be shown on videos in gay clubs. I can I can believe that. Um, this whole sequence with the outhouse was supposed to be very very complicated because they had to take down one wall depending on where it was where they're going to be filming and then replace it and then take down another wall sometimes the roof and it doesn't really seem like something that Danny Steinman would have a whole lot of patience for that sounds like something he would have just handed off to the director of yeah. cinematography. Yeah, he was like, all right, yeah, I'm going to be doing a couple lines over here. You do it. You know what else everybody always picks on that I, ne I, I again, I never noticed because I never gave a shit because I was so into the movie, but the pink sweater. I didn't notice that until my last viewing of this movie. Um, and then I couldn't stop noticing it, like, on, off, on, off, on, off. Yeah, I mean, I, 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 I'd seen, I've, I've seen this a lot, um, but I never, I never picked up on it until the documentaries came out and people started talking about it. I was like, oh, okay. I mean, it's just one of millions of clothing mistakes it, both in this series and in movies in general yeah like happens. hell uh what was it in the opening of jason goes to hell when the fbi agent is running through the forest there are certain long shots you can see the fact that when she's running through the forest she's wearing boots really yeah yeah there's a specific 
it's a it's a long shot where she's running towards the camera and she's coming from pretty far away and she sort of runs on an angle um but you can clearly see that she's got like uh doc martin style boots oh wow that must have been a pickup um because she did run barefoot through those woods and she fucked up her feet really bad yeah maybe the maybe the doc martins were like you said a pickup of you know she's run through it enough times and yeah well need it needed to she, protect him yeah well she's she's a stunt woman as i'm sure you know mm -hmm. and um so she wasn't she didn't give a shit um so she was just ready to do whatever and then um they had done this the running several times from several different angles and then adam marcus noticed her feet were all bloody and he was like all right stop and then he went on to set picked her up and carried her off set you hear me, um huh. that's sweet of him yeah <laughs> i don't think it's something danny steinman would do no because <laughs> yeah she was willing to keep going and he was like no you're not <laughs> So yeah, she odd needs little medical attention. Odd odd little side note about Junior's killing there. Um, mm -hmm. So in the video game that came out a couple years ago, not the old Nintendo one, but the most recent one, the multiplayer game. Um, the they there's different models of Jason for each of the movies. You can play as almost every one of them, with the exception of. Uh, like the last two or three, so like Jason X, Jason X for like the last three or four. Mm -hmm. Um, and they give each one a signature weapon. Mm -hmm. None of the signature weapons make any fucking sense whatsoever. The one that they give him from part four is a reference to part f to this, and it's a reference to the cleaver scene of Junior's killing. But it's not a cleaver. They call it a pig splitter. And it's a cleaver on what looks like a long, like a broom handle. Ooh. Oh, I know you're talking about. Yeah. I know what you're talking about. Because they, they use one of them. Have you ever seen um, Slaughterhouse? No. Yeah, they use one of them um, hmm. in that. Ooh, that's a that's a gnarly looking thing. Yeah, but for some reason they give it, like I said, to the final chapter model of Jason, who yeah. has never used it. And that's weird. yeah, and it's debatable that he even uses it in this one. I think that the um, the helmet, I guess. Um, that he's wearing probably helps, but I always thought that was a really good likeness, that head. Yeah. It was, for some of the other dodgy special effects, it was a really well done mannequin head. And that was another thing, too, that was cut by the MPAA, where his head was supposed to bounce like a few more times. And they only let it bounce like twice or something. If you can see my eyes rolling right now, know, like that is so uh, stupid. Those ticky tack little MPAA violations. Head bounces too many times. Mm -hmm. That's a piss off, would you? Six bored fat housewives from Encino who don't get laid are deciding all of the contents for the movies in the country. Great. I, 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 be I feel so bad for him. For who, Joey? Yeah. Because she makes a total ass out of him. And he's really sweet. <laughs> I feel bad for him at the same time. That was a... I, he put himself out there, but maybe he shouldn't have tried to throw for the touchdown. Yeah. He came in a little too strong. But I don't think that he exactly knew what 
to do in these situations. I think that everything he... I'm probably <laughs> dissecting and going a little too deep for a Friday the 13th movie, but I just assumed that everything that the character knew about relationships between men and women were what he'd seen in movies, and he probably got the idea to come onto her from what they were watching. Um, so he, he didn't know how men and women really interact with each other. That could be, you know, and given she didn't him, have to laugh at him. That was yeah, mean. yeah. The laughing was that was cold. That and his that, big blue eyes always made me feel worse because he's got these big puppy dog eyes and he's he's just got a really sweet face. I was like, oh, you could have been nicer, Juliet. <laughs> That's right. She'll get what's coming to her in a very meh kill. <laughs> Quite. Very underwhelming. I've heard some speculation that... Um, I don't know where the hell I heard this from. Because you, you hear so much stuff about these movies and you don't know if you, if it's from Crystal Lake Memories because it's got so much information or if it's from a commentary or if it's from a podcast. or Because there are so many movies and there are so many fans of these movies and there are so many people who have so many different um, assumptions or speculate on certain things. Um, but I've heard people say that... Um, they were under the impression that because Joey struck out with Juliet's character, that he was going to try the moves on Tiffany Helm. Which what? I ne I never interpreted that as at all. No, no. I always took it as he he was he hurt. needed a shoulder. Got, yeah, yeah. He got shot down, and he needed the a shoulder to cry on. I was going to say, and now a completely gratuitous nude scene, but that's yeah. this movie. <laughs> yeah. I think her apology... Well, she, and she, yeah, she feels bad. I, I, think, I think it would have been more effective had she been wearing a top. Because yes. when... Because this... Because all, cause all you, you can see are the boobs. And that he made her lie on top of the covers. Don't pull the covers up, Juliet. Oh, no. Nope, nope. Make sure they stop under the boobs, please. Yes. Because that's how all women sleep. Mm-hmm. We want nipples fully erect, please. Thank you. This is the movie what we're making here. <laughs> One thing that I don't really think gets addressed anywhere near as much as it should is Reggie's completely bizarre scream. <laughs> what is that? And why was it left in the movie? If there ever there was a time for a Wilhelm scream. <laughs> you know, that would have been actually less ridiculous than Reggie's scream. Mm -hmm. And I, I've heard people actually, Friday fans, say that they like his scream. That they enjoy it. And no, it's, mm -hmm. it's ear piercing and it's out of place and... In God's name, why? Mm. It was like he was the final girl for a second there. <laughs> um, the one in particular, when they're in the rain. I kind of like this song. New wavy. Um, but yeah, yeah very, when they're in... Very 80s Depeche Mode kind yeah, of. Yeah, totally. 
Uh, but yeah, when they're in the rain and he really lets loose, that's when the scream is really bad. And from what I've heard, that dance scene was another one of the Danny Steinman I'll turn the camera on, just do something moments. Oh, God. Like, and a re if I remember correctly from the book, from the Crystal Lake Memories book, um, Tiffany Helm said that there was originally supposed to be another song that she was supposed to dance to. Yeah. And it wasn't her kind of music, and she was, she, so she asked to switch the music. And then she could do a dance that she wanted to do um, and enjoy the music at the same time. And that's when Danny Steinman just went, yeah, you know what? The hell with it. Just do whatever you're going to do. We'll make the scene work. <laughs> um, uh, um, as I'm sure, you know, um, with uh with low budget movies and then they can't get the the um the rights or the licensing to play a song they'll play a song when they're shooting and then well, and have like carry the actors dance and then do a song that has the same beat um for the that little streak right there that was not good um, that sound that sounds like it or has the same beat, so it looks like they're dancing to it. Right. Um, but there's a movie called uh, another French movie called Raw, where there's a club scene, and the director did something that I've never heard a director do before at a party seat where with the party scenes where their actors are supposed to be dancing she went up to every extra and told them exactly what to do told them how to move where to stand twist here move your head like this everybody's doing something different so that when the music when they put the music in the movie it you couldn't watch it and be like that's not the song that they're listening to because they're not moving to that beat <laughs> That's a level of micromanagement that's... Well, she had a vision. Uh, apparently. <laughs> <laughs> and, and it works. I haven't seen it myself, but um, from what I've, I've heard from people who, ha who actually have seen it visually, um, it looks real. Because when I you mean, go to a club... Everybody isn't dancing the same way. Right. Yeah. Everyone's got their own. Everybody's got their own moves. Everybody thinks, you know, they look good doing whatever. Um, but yeah, and I think it was really important for that scene, too, because it was a college party. Here come. What? What? Why? How? I don't think I could have made that that scream at any point in my prepubescent no. life. Mm -mm. I don't think I could have made that scream as a newborn. That may be the highest pitched scream in Friday the 13th. I would say in slasher movie history. I think the only scream that might come close to it strangely enough to reference this movie for a second time in this commentary would be uh, Pieces. The bastard scene. Oh god. <laughs> if I ever do that movie and I probably will because it's so stupid that's going to be the intro. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I'm I'm making my sales pitch right now if you're gonna do that movie just count me in i mean awesome it's it's not a good movie at all but i will sit there and laugh at its stupidity you're penciled in my friend awesome like i i watched it and i 
I, it was another one of those I watched it because I remembered the box art movies. And, it's an awesome cover. Oh, yeah. It's very striking. Very memorable. And I, I finished the movie and I just went, what the hell did I just watch? What was any of that? <laughs> Especially after the ending. That ending is just... Yeah. That that is one of horror. That's one of horror, horror's most memorable endings for. I don't all the know. wrong reasons. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Certainly none of the reasons that they intended. No. I really must say, I enjoy. Um, what do we call him? Fake Shemp. Uh, Jason, <laughs> I like his intro right there, bursting through the door. That was good. Yeah. There's there's so much about this final act that I think is just so fucking intense, and it's not like um. Scary intense, but it's it's like thrill ride intense to me. I can see that it is. It does have intensity to it, um, and there is definitely a good amount of up and down, like the chasing. Some of it, yeah, and some of it doesn't make sense, but I don't care. It's just cool. It's fun. I like Reggie being the badass for about a second and a half <laughs> on that thing. This all red jumpsuit or mm -hmm. tracksuit. I'm hoping it's real, but I have a um, an autographed eight by ten. That I got off of Amazon. That's signed by both of them. By Reggie uh, and uh, Melanie Kinnaman. Yeah. Oh. I didn't know Amazon sold autographs. Um. Yeah. The a lot of them come with. A certificates of authenticity, but you never know. Right. I, I bought a handful. I didn't. Pay, I bought a handful. I didn't pay too much for them. Um, I don't know. I went through a brief period where I was collecting autographs. Um, I think the most that I paid. Well, the most that I paid was sixty bucks. And it was for um, a really nice framed um, promotional advert uh, for Sorority House Massacre 2. And um, below it was a card that one of the actresses who was in it, Melissa Moore, signed. She didn't actually sign the artwork, which would have been preferable um but yeah I put, that was the that was a mosaic and the second was 45 for um i think i got yeah i got two so it was 90 uh two different um uh john cassier autographs I only have two autographs in my collection, and I came about both of them by complete surprise. They were both gifts. Mm -hmm. um, and neither of them are in the horror vein. Uh, mm. w one of them uh, what, one of them is an autographed football by uh, Joe Montana oh. that uh, oh. my boss, uh, an old boss that I used to work for had. It was sitting in her in her office and I turned around and I saw it for the first time. I'm like, holy crap, you got a Joe Montana autographed football. Where'd you get that? And she's like, oh, I got it. I can't remember where she said she got it from. She's, all of a sudden she goes, do you want it? Like, 
Mom. Say what? She goes, yeah, I don't care. I'm not a football fan. You want it? Take it. Okay. <laughs> it's only my favorite football player of all time. Sure, I'll take the autograph football from you. Uh, That's awesome. The other one is um, Haley Atwell. She's the actress who plays Peggy Carter in the MCU movies. Uh, she is my number one, like, crush. I, I, not even, like, in a sexual way. If I met her, I would turn beet red and giggle and stare at my feet. <laughs> I just... I. She's just so cool and so beautiful and has just the most amazing, soothing voice. Um, and a friend of mine knows my crush on her. And she met her at uh, uh, Dragon Con in Philly a few years ago. And unbeknownst to me, she got her to not only sign a picture of her dressed as Agent Carter uh, to me, she got her to write happy birthday Aww. and then sent it to me for, for, and didn't tell me. She just goes, you're getting something in the mail for your birthday. Let me know when you open it. So I open it up and there's happy birthday from, from Haley Atwell. And I, I don't think I stopped smiling for like 24 hours. Wow. I always kind of wondered why he didn't do his ninja skills on Jason. Like, you've demonstrated... I mean, I know that he just got slashed across the chest, but, like... You've shown that you're a pretty big badass throughout the entire movie. Throw a kick. Do something. I think, well, there, in that moment, um, I think he was a little too shook up. Because like, he was having a surrealistic moment. Like... He spent however long locked away, petrified of this guy, and hoping and fearing that they would never meet. And then now they're face to face. Well, yeah, storyline wise, I understand, but I guess I wanted the martial arts stuff to pay off in the final fight. Hmm. But I guess it goes against the expectation of you've built him up and then in the final moments he freezes. That can be viewed as a subversion of sorts. Yeah. Can you hear, is that me? Can you, is it just me or can you hear him breathing? Behind oh, I the can, mask. I can hear him breathing. I don't th I never noticed that. Neither did I. Wow. And it's loud, like yeah. really, really loud. I never noticed that before. That's cool though. Because you know um it's a person in there. I think that's like the first big hint that it's a it's a a real person in there. It's not a a mongoloid. Yeah, it does give it a nice humanistic touch. Yeah. Now, I don't know about you. I spent about 12 years of my life in farm territory. Oh, never. Had a lot of buddies with... with had a buddy who had not uh, both... A, um, they had Christmas tree farm. This was out. I lived in the Pacific Northwest. And uh, cattle. He had like 150 acres. And I lived across the street from someone who had 60 acres and multiple horses. And they both had hay, a lot of, you know, a lot of hay baling and uh, equipment and stuff. Um, I don't know what the hell that bed of spikes tool is. I have I no. What the hell is that medieval looking uh... thing? That's no farm equipment I'm familiar with. I don't think anybody really knows. 
Because you're not the... <laughs> it's not the first time I've heard this question asked. I have no idea. I mean, that is some Marquis de Sade level torture device bizarre shit on a farm. I... Oh, we passed the point where she, he opened the door and she came out with the chainsaw conveniently running. Mm-hmm. Silently behind the door. Because that's how chainsaws were. Soundproof door. <laughs> Very common in barns. <laughs> or maybe it was the rain. Very loud rain. Terribly loud. <laughs> rain, 20 decibels. Chainsaw, 120 decibels. Yeah, they cancel each other out. There you go. Glad to see you cops have finally shown up. Hmm. I will say that is one other thing that annoys me in this movie is that if you're going to have cops in there, use them. And mm -hmm. like they have the sheriff for a while. And then after the scene with the, with the mayor, he's completely vacant until or completely vanished until they need him to drop the, oh, by the way, exposition here at the end. Mm -hmm. And it just, oh man, it, if it, I just wish that the cops, I, I love it when cops play an active role in a slasher. I don't know why, but I just like seeing them be competent and effective instead of incompetent and useless. Yeah. Bumbling idiots like in like last house on the left or yeah. Intruder. Um, I always thought it was ridiculous how the picture of Dominic that they show is clearly an onset photograph that was taken right? the day, <laughs> the day of, and I'm pretty sure he's wearing the same hoodie. Well, then that makes this upcoming picture in the newspaper even more ridiculous. Yeah. Who the hell got that picture of Jason in a hockey mask? Yeah, I know. Maybe that's another artist's interpretation. Perhaps. <laughs> yeah, there's definitely shenanigans afoot here. I'm not I'm not debating it. Um, I think some of the biggest shenanigans are about to come up and that is the hockey mask and the knife conveniently placed in the drawer. I don't know what the fuck that was. Totally normal for uh, for implements like that to be included in the hospital drawer of someone who's just survived a mass murder. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Standard police procedure. Mm -hmm. One thing that I always notice when he stabs her and he starts laughing when I used to be able to actually see this movie. My, my eyes were always gravitated to how perfect his teeth are. And I'm going to look. Right there. Oh, watching. yeah. The, the thing that I always noticed was that after he stabs her, Pam throws her head back in agony at first, and then she brings her head back and looks at him like, oh, you son of a bitch. <laughs> I was too mesmerized by the teeth. <laughs> it's like the head back is one thing. I'm fine with that, but it's when she brings her head forward again and looks at him, and she's just got this perturbed look like, you forgot to take the roast out of the oven, didn't you, dumbass? <laughs> It's just the wrong expression, but it's hilarious. Well, it shouldn't have been there anyway. She sh it should have like cut to her on the floor or something. And the perspective here is always 
I've never been able to quite figure it out. Like, is how, how reclined is Tommy at this point? Because it looks I like he's know. looking at the ceiling. Uh... But Jason's not floating. He's standing at the foot of the bed. So, I, I don't know. Well, I think you have to blame Danny Steinman's direction for that. With continuity between shots? Who needs it? He was just worried about the next tit shot or the next line. Yep. And by line, I think you know what I mean. Oh, she won't show boobs? Have her not wear a bra. Yeah. Well, uh, for obvious reasons. That's something I never noticed. Um, but yeah, from what I hear, she's clearly not wearing a bra throughout that whole sequence. Oh yeah, she's she's definitely not. I never noticed. Never noticed. Nor is Tiffany Helm in her dance scene. That I think I noticed. And now the most confusing ending of any of them. Mm -hmm. um... I think part six, you have the way that part six goes. You, you have one of two options. Either you chalk it up to a dream mm -hmm. or... It really happened, but somehow she was able to get away from him, and he yeah. got detained. Yeah, that's the I, way I always interpreted it. I've never really been a fan of either one, but no. there's no better answer. No. But yeah, that's what I always assume. Uh, and it's really not clear in part six if when he and Hawes are going to the cemetery if they are actually escaping or if they have actually been released. Because Hoss does say something about if they find out what we're doing, they'll have us locked up and blah, 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 permanent. Um, I always assumed that it was just a release, but I did recently hear someone say that they had escaped, which... Yeah, that's just I, speculation. I'm not... I don't know that I buy that. I I would think that if they had escaped, there would have been some type of law enforcement pursuit. Oh, for sure, yeah. And that the sheriff in Crystal Lake may have gotten... you know, the, Maybe not directly would have gotten notified, but that there would have been an APB of some kind put out of, hey... Two escaped mental patients. One of them is the semi-famous survivor of not one but two mass murders. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, we don't get that. No. <laughs> okay. I, I've never watched through the credits of any of these. It just said special thanks to Converse shoes and Nike shoes. Oh. That's an odd thing to thank. Well, maybe, um, maybe they got some new kicks. I guess. Not thanks to like the location where they filmed, or oh, they didn't do that too. No, it just said special thanks to Nike shoes, Converse shoes, and then it's got the list of stars, and now it's got the MPAA logo. Because for some reason they put the the cast at the very end of the credits. I hate it when they did that. I that always annoyed me when they used to do that. They do that in another Friday, don't they? They did that in final chapter, which I again I have never sat through the the credits of any of these. So I didn't notice until just these watches that they put the cast at the end, which is so. Well, that's. That's commonplace now, um, where it's, um, you know, they do the opening title sequence at the very end. Mm -hmm. 
um, which annoys me because it's always, um, if I'm watching a movie, a new movie that's audio described and I don't know anything about it and it's like, okay, I know that voice. Who is that? And it'll bother me until I pause the movie and then Wikipedia. Um, but if I'd had the opening titles, I might have had an idea that, oh, so-and-so is in this one. I didn't know that. Um, yeah, and the same, the same too, with um, the director. Um, it's like, I, I, I was always somebody who read all, all the, the credits. Um, I can't say that I read them to the very, very end, but I, I always read them the opening titles and I got used to seeing a lot of names, especially like casting directors and producers and shit like that. Um, I didn't start kind of miss it. I didn't start doing it until I moved to Michigan to be with my wife and her family has always stayed throughout the entire credits. Like they stay till the house lights come up <laughs> and oh, wow. yeah. So uh, not at home, like at home, fast forward, but you go, we go to the theaters, we stay through the credits to the very bitter end, which ended up paying off when the Marvel movies started coming out because they were always putting shit at the end of the credits. But for any other movie, you know, you're sitting there waiting, and especially now with CGI, and it takes like 300 people to do CGI. Oh, those credit sequences go on for like 10 minutes. Um, the only time I remember staying for an entire end credit sequence was when they did a limited, uh, uh, theatrical run for the original Nightmare on Elm Street for the 20th anniversary and after the credits they had like a greatest hits of Freddy's best kills through all the movies um, so yeah the lights the lights stayed off so if you were leaving you were leaving in the dark but I wanted to see it anyway because it was like kind of the closest thing to seeing all the movies on the big screen that I was ever going to get. So. But it it ended up as a special feature on the DVD. (laughs) Anyway. I think I've seen... I think I've seen most of those in the theater. Three forward. (sighs) Not... but not But not the remake. Because again... Like Friday the Thirteenth remake, I saw the trailer and went, "Yeah, no, that's that is not money well spent." You have to see Nightmare Three and Four on the big screen. Yep. Wow. Once I was a horror movie fan, I made my parents take me to just about all of them. I think I saw the. I think I saw both the Hellraiser, the first... No, I saw all four Hellraisers on the big screen. Your parents um, took you to see Hellraiser? Hmm? Oh my god. Yeah. It was my parents' idea to, like... That was the... I think that was the last horror movie where they were... Where they kept going, are you sure you can handle it? Are you sure you can handle it? This is really intense. Are you? Do you think this... Do you think you're going to be okay? I'm like... It's going to be fine. Let's just watch the movie. <laughs> and it was fine and nothing. No, I take it back. Not the first one. I didn't see the first one in theaters, but the, the, the other three. Because the first one was at home and they were all nervous about it. And if you're, and once I proved that it didn't bother me, they were like, okay, well, I guess he's bulletproof. There you Good. go. Um... Did you, um, because I rarely got to see, uh, horror movies on the big screen, like, especially the big franchise ones, because my parents would never take me. Um, and by the time I was old enough to go 
by myself, um, they weren't really making them anymore. Um, but the few that I did remember seeing, um, ugh. and sometimes it fools you because you, because the experience is so much fun with the crowd interaction and like screaming and, you know, laughing and shouting at the screen and all that stuff. It kind of makes you think like the movie's good mm -hmm. when it's not. Yep. Because I had that happen with both Halloween 6 and 7. So I left the theater thinking, wow, that was pretty good. Both times. And then seeing it on DVD. No, it was not. Um, but do you like the theater experience or the at-home-in-the-dark experience? At home. I... Once upon a time, it was I would have said theater, but um, technology. I mean, I you know, I got fifty six inches of high def plasma. That's yes, it's not forty feet wide and twenty feet tall, but I get a crystal clear picture just as I do in the theater. Uh, my couch is just as comfy as a movie theater chair. I get to eat my own snacks. I don't have annoying babies who shouldn't be in a movie like that around me. Uh, yeah, there's... I don't need the crowd experience. I, I, I prefer being in my own... in my own room and, and just experiencing it at home. Uh, I think... If I were able to, the I would only be going to revival theaters. Yeah. Because we had, um, I don't know if we still do, but we had um, exhumed films, which I think might be a chain. A very small one, but I've heard of them elsewhere. I think elsewhere in Pennsylvania. But um, they show like cult classic horror movies. Um, and unfortunately, I never got to go because I found out about it too late. So I missed fucking Silent Night, Deadly Night on the big screen. And I missed Sleepaway Camp on the big screen. That I still kick myself for. Um, and they would have themes based on the holidays. Because, you know, there was a horror movie for every holiday in the 80s. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so there were always Christmas horror movies. Like Christmas double features. Like Silent Night, Deadly Night with Christmas Evil. And shit like that. Um... And I didn't get to go. I don't think it's there anymore. There, wa there was another one um, that was open for may maybe four months, I want to say. This was like three years ago. And um, I was going to try to find a way to go because I had found their Facebook page and I knew some of the movies that they had shown um, and they were some of my favorites and I was just like okay even if I can't see the fucking screen I'm just going to go for the theater experience and to listen to it I'm going to find somewhere to go and um, I found got in contact with somebody this was pre-covid um so i got in contact with somebody who uh, uh, uh was um behind the the facebook page and i was like because i couldn't find anything on google so i was like is there a calendar for any of your movies um because i was i wanted to know what your schedule was like Oh, we already closed. I was like, what? I was not happy. 
the closest thing we have to that is there's a um there's a local theater chain called MJR and uh pre covid I don't know if they still do it but pre covid once a month or I'm sorry once a week um like Saturday mornings or Sunday mornings or some some odd time some odd time that wasn't prime time movie theater you know experience so it wouldn't take up a screen from whatever blockbuster was out they would have one screen dedicated to showing just an old movie <clears throat> any old i mean it, it wasn't horror focused but it was it was a top it was it was a well-known movie that was a classic so it could be ghostbusters or the karate kid or uh the godfather or uh, star wars uh, whatever happened to baby jane it could be anything uh but occasionally they did do horror as long as it was a a really well-known really popular horror movie so uh psycho friday the 13th the original nightmare on elm street the original halloween the original you didn't get dream warriors or final chapter it was just the most well known in the original versions of horror movies so yeah it was yeah it would be cool to have something more horror themed but unfortunately that was the limit of their interest in it and i never got around to seeing anything that they did it, it and it pissed me off too because I missed my chance to see Halloween. I missed my chance to see the original Friday, the uh, the original Nightmare. And now I don't know that they do it. Um. The um. Uh, the year after that, the the twentieth anniversary of um of Elm Street um. It, th this was at a uh, United Arts Theater. Um, so the year after they did, I think, um, I think they did Halloween. Um, not for an anniversary, but just as a limited run um, for Halloween because Elm Street took, the showing took place during Halloween. Um I I don't remember why, but I didn't get to go. And then the next year, they did it again with Halloween 4 and 5, a double feature. And that year I didn't get to go because at the time, um, the fucking asshole that I was with at the time was... Um let's just say he moved to another state because he didn't pay his rent. Um, so I thought it was going to be a thing like every year where they were going to start doing these, these revivals of, of horror films. But I think it stopped after that year, after the four, Halloween four and five. I think the closest, the the only other option that we've had here is uh, during COVID when you could rent theaters, mm -hmm. um, and the same theater chain MJR, you could either rent. It was one hundred ninety nine bucks. You got to invent to uh, invite twenty people, uh, and you could see a first run movie, so anything that was brand new, or you could do ninety nine bucks, still get twenty people. And you could pick from that back catalog of classic movies. And I know that the first movies of the big three slashers were on there, uh, along with The Exorcist, um, Alien. There was a couple other really big horror movies. Um, Scream, I think, was another one. Uh, and I really, really wanted to do that, but we were, it was supposed to be a family night. So we ended up getting the karate kid. 
Uh, and you now say I don't. So regrettably, <laughs> and, and I only say it regrettably because I really wanted to be able to watch something like Halloween on a, you know, just to have that experience. Because I was one when Halloween came out, so it would have been cool to see that. I'd already seen the Karate Kid in theaters. Um, oh, excuse me. But, uh, but it was for the kids, so you know, all right, cool. They got to see Karate Kid on the in the theater. It was cool for them, so that was. That was cool. Just, I don't think they offer that anymore now. So I missed my window to see those, those movies. Um, I remember a couple years ago they did. I don't know if it was just at specialty theaters, um, or if it was like a wide release. But they did the. I guess it was for an anniversary of. It was either the first or second Alien, and it was all. Ah, hit the mic. It was all polished, and supposedly it looked incredible. Um, from what I heard, I think it was the second one. Hmm. I don't know. Um, I'm not really big on. I mean, I could appreciate them, but I'm not really big on science fiction oriented horror. Uh, I might have gone to see Alien or Aliens, um, but um, any final thoughts on uh, Friday the 13th Part 5? I can't believe I'm going to say this. I like it a little more than the last time I watched it. Nice. Um, I, I still, it's still not an upper up echelon Friday for me. It will never be one of the first ones I reach for. Uh, but it's camp value is growing on me a bit. Awesome. Well, I didn't think that I would say this, but I appreciated it a little more because of that little bit at the end where he was, you could hear him breathing behind the mask. I never noticed that before. And it I was thought nice that touch. was, it, I thought it was a very nice touch. Definitely. Yeah. And it was cool that you were, you're actually able to hear it now. But, um, yeah. So we are gonna, put a lid on this one jed it was a blast to have you along thank you for joining me thank you for having me again and uh i want to say thanks to everybody for listening and for staying until the bitter end so until next time this is brandon ford wishing you all unpleasant dreams <laughs>